So we're excited to kick off our panel on climate solutions. Joining me on the panel are Igmar Renshawk, CEO of We Don't Have Time, Igor Kogish, CEO of GA Drilling. Both of you could give us a maybe a three minute or so overview of each of your organizations, starting with We Don't Have Time. Thank you so much, Scott, and thanks for inviting me to this um, interesting uh, conversation. Uh, we don't have time. We are a global review platform for climate solutions. Uh, so what We Don't Time is all about is that if you see someone that are doing great climate action, that have some technology or new ways of doing things, low or high tech, our community can, uh, can create what we call climate love. Uh, a review to that organization, so that will reward them uh, to do more, uh, but also en uh, educate and, and spread this love and solution to so many more. So if you have a solution for us in one part of the world, in Australia, now suddenly people all over the world can embrace it and, and implement it uh, everywhere. Uh, because we really need to focus on the solutions. If we only focus on the doom and gloom, uh, that could actually make people more passive. And uh, what we need in order to solve the climate crisis is more active people. So today we have 65,000 members uh, from 150 countries sharing those solutions, uh, creating those reviews. And it's very much people in finance, in business, in politics, and also engage consumers that really want to do something uh, and contribute. But unfortunately, as you know, not everything is about uh, that all companies and all governments are working on solutions. Men are doing also the opposite. So a review system, you also need to have the possibility to say that someone needs to change. So you can also give climate warnings. That is a negative review. Uh, and uh, I mean, we, we now know that we can't drill for more oil, but many countries are still doing it. So that deserves climate warning, I would say. Uh, but what We Don't Time is also about is not just sharing about what's good and bad. It's also about engaging in a dialogue. And I'm very proud that we have had dialogues going on with our community, with everything from Jeff Bezos to Mark Zuckerberg to the president of Brazil to uh, the EU president for the Green New Deal uh, and many, many others. Uh, I think four out of five big oil companies has answered on, on reviews on our platforms. And uh, that's important because we will not change by stop talking to people. We need to talk to people. So uh, we know time is a tool you and everyone can use if you have an opinion and if you want to get in contact with the pe people that could change things. Uh, so that's a short version of We Don't Have Time. Go to wedonthetime.org and check it out for yourself while, while you're watching and after this broadcast. Okay, great. Thank you for that overview. And how about for Jay Drilling? Yeah, I fully agree that uh, now the words are not enough, so we have to bring solutions. And uh, uh, what is our clear uh, target of our uh, team and uh, company and our partners is to uh, really bring something that is uh, today missing in a renewable energy mix. It's a solution that uh, can work 24 hours per day. You can rely on that. It's independent and it's clean, first of all. And uh, here, what we want to unlock is the geothermal energy uh, that lies everywhere uh, below our feet. Uh, but the problem is to get there. And uh, if you want to make uh, such kind of the great uh, utilization of the renewables and examples like Iceland, for example, uh, in all the other places like in the US, Europe, uh, elsewhere, uh, you have to go for the same energy much deeper. Uh, because we have to be closer to the, to the, the core of, the, uh, of our Earth uh, when the temperature uh, is enough and uh, can uh, really supply all the energy needs of the mankind. And uh, how you can get there is by the new way of the drilling. The, all the drilling today in the world is based on oil and gas industry. It's running for 150 years. It's very proven. Uh, you have uh, 10,000 of people working there. The problem of geothermal is 
that uh, it is drilling, but you have to go much deeper uh, in the hard rocks. And the technologies and solutions that can enable it, uh, they are not today present. And this is the today showstopper to make the Iceland uh, in any big city when you need it, not only for the electricity production, but also for the heating, for the transport energy, whatever. So our aim in GA drilling is to develop the new technology that uh, we are now in the phase of uh, uh, continuous uh, testing and now planning to uh, be available in a soon time and uh, being able to unlock these deep depths uh, for the energy. And uh, last but not least, uh, the target here is that uh, if we are able to converge as a small part of the today's drilling industry, uh, that is now, of course, drilling for fossil fuels predominantly, into drilling for the clean energy, uh, that's something that can totally change in the uh, next several years, the energy map, and to solve the uh, problems that we see also today as a, as a big uh, issues, not only from the clean perspective, but also from the independence and uh, sustainability. All right, great. Thank you for that overview, Igor. So going back to Igmar, I know that uh, last week was Earth Day, and of course, we don't have time uh, had a global international broadcast. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit from that in terms of both the experience, but the also the level of engagement. And specifically for our theme, we're really interested in understanding how your organization uh, and your partners are working to help address large-scale climate solutions. Yes, so... Uh, we don't have time. We have existed uh, as a concept for five years and uh, as an organization for two, four years. Uh, and the very first public appearance that we don't have time organization were hosting was actually back on Earth Day 2018. Uh, we wanted to reach a global audience and uh, it's hard to do that if you're a new organization. Uh, so we came up with this idea to create a global digital climate conference uh, like we're doing now, uh, where we invited speakers from all parts of the world. We even had someone from an Arctic uh, science station, etc. Uh, and we broadcasted that and made it very public available. Uh, this doesn't sound so complicated today. But this was long before, or at least years before Corona. So no one had actually done it before. And uh, we had two reasons why we did it. One reason was to, to reach a global audience. Uh, but the other re reason was to show that you can do things in a new way. You don't need to fly to go to a climate conference and speak about that we should stop flying. You can just stop flying and do it anyway. And you can have a better success doing it. So that was what We Don't Have Time was been doing every Earth Day since then. And last Earth Day, on Friday, we had 13 million viewers compared to 10,000 viewers on the first Earth Day five years ago. So this is the speed uh, every, all the solution needs to grow. We need to grow exponentially. And I'm very, very proud that we have been growing very much since the start of the organization. And we haven't done that alone, of course, because the interest and more and more people are dragged into the climate. And in a couple of years from now, it will be even more people. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, everything is going to be about solving the climate crisis. Uh, even the deniers will be engaged in this when their own life is on, on danger. Uh, so, so the engagement, it's growing. I see, I mean, it's happened so much in those five years, even though it's happening too little. Um, regarding what we focused on on the broadcast, our focus was actually how to use nature uh, in order to, to succeed, stay under the Paris Agreement, and not just protect the nature, use nature as solutions. And one partner uh, we had uh, helping us organize this uh, is a very interesting company called Terraformation. Uh, it's actually the ex-CEO of Reddit and, and, and some of his Silicon Valley colleagues uh, that have looked into this, that we need to plant one billion trees. Uh, and we don't have a global system to do that. So he has created this amazing organization called Terraformation, uh, that has a mission to help the world doing that. And uh, he's going to do it uh, in a way uh, that Silicon Valley companies have succeeded. Silicon Valley companies have, ha haven't brought any new ideas. They have just 
took the ideas of something that could work and they have figured out how to scale it. Uh, and this is important. We have all the solutions. That's not the problem. Uh, we now need people and organizations that are able to scale them in exponentially. Uh, and in order to do that, we, we need to communicate them exponentially. And that's what I'm focusing on. Okay. Well, I think there are certainly other researchers that would argue that planting trees is not necessarily the fastest or the pathway. But without necessarily going to that conversation, let's stay on the topic of scale. Scale is the name of the game. And net zero is going to be difficult and likely be delayed. Uh, but the adverse impact of climate change uh, we're seeing now, but it's going to last for centuries after we reach net zero. So how do we focus on carbon capture and sequestration? So it's one thing to stop the emission aspect, but we need a way to have direct carbon capture. And I know companies like ClimateWorks, Carbon Engineering are trying to suck, literally suck the carbon from the air, but will that be enough? Or will their footprint need to be really the size of twice the size of EU, for example, to make a difference and that those types of technologies are pervasively uh, available throughout the world? What are your thoughts and, and how do we scale uh, to really make a difference and how do we solve the, the cost, the financing issue as well? Oh, Igor, maybe you first. Uh, mm, that's not directly what we are doing, of course, but... Uh... In general, uh, yes, I think there is uh, no single solution, of course, uh, for everything. Important is to have the right mix and the right timing, what is urgent. So uh, definitely in the end, uh, once we are able to reduce the uh, carbon emissions significantly, uh, there will be also important in question, okay, can we revert the process itself? And uh, from my perspective, uh, is the absolute priority now to significantly decrease the still uh, very high in some countries increasing uh, production of the of the carbon and uh, also uh, of course you want to do the scale because that's about the scale we are not talking about some isolated solutions that you need uh, a lot of plenty of new energy that will be needed for this uh, carbon sequestration so uh, here even we are working uh, for the geothermal underground there are also projects for example for storing in the future uh, mm -hmm. such kind of carbon. Also, I know that one first geothermal project for carbon capturing is uh, as a pilot running in Iceland, uh, but it is really as a now as a showcase uh, that is far away from scalability due to the energy you need for that. So it doesn't make sense to uh, produce much more energy globally to carbon capture and to be in some cycle. Uh, from our perspective, uh, it should be hand in hand uh, that our concentration, and I'm fully with you what you mentioned, that uh, focus on the scale. So we can uh, do many small solutions, but uh, I think it's now the very right time to look for the applicable, scalable solution that can bring the significant change in next uh, several years. And uh, then to build all the ecosystems around it. For example, uh, that's why we decided for geothermal is not only energy production, but you can create all the, let's say, local sustainable economy around because it's uh, not only about the uh, uh, electricity. Also, you can heat, us, uh, heat it, you can uh, use it for agriculture and so on in very sustainable, clean way. So this is the way how we see it as an enabler also for the other solutions. So same with you, Igor, uh, is that I think there are some perception out there that uh, solar and wind is more than sufficient and certainly the co levelized cost makes it makes a sense to continue on that path for renewables. However, it's not necessarily always relevant or appropriate depending on the region. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more around geothermal, uh, because again, there's another set of misconception that geothermal is only applicable for certain areas, maybe closer to volcanoes or uh, regions that you can easily tap into. But what's the reality? Um, yes, uh, you are right that uh, today's geothermal is uh, very limited regarding the uh, applicability. Um, I maybe the easiest way is if I can if I can show for a few seconds the picture that what's the difference of today's geothermal. So on the left hand uh, map, what you see uh, is the situation in Europe, but it's similar also in the other continent. When only mentioned Iceland is suitable because of enough energy that is near surface, and uh, all the rest of the Europe you see is in a dark colors. This is a temperature map in some three to five kilometers. 
But if you are able to drill deeper effectively, that is not today possible with conventional technologies, okay. you can see that the uh, majority of the area converts to something like Iceland. So this is the easiest, uh, let's say, answer to show that how technological shift that we are not far from this uh, can change the situation dramatically and use it anywhere. And uh, your second question uh, regarding the positioning of the geothermal among the energy mix, the huge advantage uh, is uh, first uh, in the position that you can retrofit coal and uh, other power plants uh, by the geothermal one-to-one. -one. It's baseload energy. It means it's running day and night. You don't need the storage. Uh, so it has no some uh, volatilities in delivery. It's very stable, similar to nuclear, uh, that you can run it uh, day and night. Second, uh, what is important uh, uh, with the geothermal is that uh, it's not only about the electricity, because specifically, and mostly wind, and, uh, but also the photovoltaics, it is about the electricity production. Here in geothermal, you can produce direct heat that is much cheaper uh, than the electricity conversion into the heat. And uh, for example, just in Europe, the number is, uh, of course, depends on the region, that half of the energy we are using is for heating. And only the rest is for all the other energies. It means electricity, transport, and so on. So geothermal can really bring this missing big part of the energy cake in the next years. That can be the big solution, and specifically for the gas that is today is widely used. Mm -hmm. And my next question is for really both of you is, which is, how has the Russia-Ukraine war heightened the importance of energy independence, especially in Europe? Uh, it's, uh, I mean, the war uh, slows the transition down in one way because we're focusing on, on this uh, acute crisis, humanitarian military crisis. But in another way, uh, it's suddenly... The engagement from um, so many uh, more people that have hasn't been engaged in the climate now understands the the blood money from oil. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, uh, the war will speed things up. And uh, actually, my view on the war is that uh, the reason why we have a war is that oil countries are losing uh, in the first place. So it's a desperate move to keep the oil pr price up. It's not just a side effect of the war, it's one part of the goal. Uh, and if you look into what's have happening before the war, you will see some countries, some actors that have heavily resisted the transition to a fossil free world. Um, so I think that uh, it will speed things up, but it's very, very sad that we need a, we need a war to realize that. Uh, I mean, wasn't it enough with a pandemic to realize that we need to change our society? Obviously not. Uh, just to, to reflect on the previous question regarding the karma removal and, and uh, trees are not a silver bullet. Bullet. We need so many so solutions, uh, low and high tech solution in order to remove carbon. And we need to remove carbon. We will never solve this without removing carbon. Uh, and in order to remove carbon, we need two things. We need energy. Uh, we need so much more energy than we use today. We need energy to suck back carbon as well. Uh, so that's where we need everything on the table in order to keep the energy uh, produ producing fossil free. Uh, the other thing we need is uh, money. We need to finance this. We actually have so many technologies to remove carbon. It's just that they are not scaling because it's not uh, profitable. So we need to make it profitable. Uh, and I think we will have a race uh, of uh, different entrepreneurs. Uh, it will be a gold digger race if we provide a finance for it. And today I'm very concerned about people calling out companies that are putting money behind carbon offsets and, and those things as greenwashers. What they should do is to tell them to, instead of doing offset, they should do carbon removal. But uh, it should not be that they don't do anything at all. We need to put money on the table uh, and we need a system for that. And, and if, if governments are not making the rule book, uh, we need businesses to do it uh, and go uh, and do this before the governments are making that rule book. It's going to happen. A lot, a lot of wisdom in, in what you shared. And uh, interesting point about uh, the war, because I think if we look at 
history, uh, there's been many cases of active violence or war to manipulate the markets, uh, to prop up the prices exactly to your point, so that the commodity price of oil stays at a, a very profitable level. Uh, now, coming back to you, uh, Igor, in terms of your thoughts around the current war that's happening in Ukraine and how that is affecting your, your business. Uh, of course, unfortunately, all this situation is uh, very tragic. And uh, regarding the independence, we see now is not uh, the question of uh, decision. It's a question of necessity uh, because uh, just yesterday, the gas uh, imports to Poland and B Bulgaria were stopped. And uh, uh, it's just a question of time when it could happen to the other countries, specifically in Europe. So um, now I see mostly politicians, but also utilities are trying to find some shortcuts and to solve the situation. Even we know that in energy markets, uh, there is nothing happening within one day. So it takes uh, always a much longer time. And we see that uh, we spent uh, not really efficiently last 10, 15 years uh, where this transition could happen more uh, systematically. And uh, I fully agree that what is needed now uh, are the focus resources. Uh, it means not only the financial resources that are important, uh, but also focus of the industry uh, that can help uh, to scale the technologies uh, that could be applicable that can bring change in some roadmap. And uh, of course, we need to solve as an eminent impact of this war uh, to solve the situation next week. And uh, of course, uh, it's hard to imagine that any kind of new solutions could be widely adapted. But uh, uh, that's something that uh, should come in the next uh, months and years. And uh, therefore, we have to make these steps immediately now. And uh, I see it uh, also reflecting in our, our experience uh, that we should find a ways how we can fast track uh, everything. It means with the right partnerships. And I'm really happy that now also this very conservative oil and gas industry is trying to think about the geothermal as a real way, how to um, trans uh, make this transition. And uh, of course, what we are expecting that uh, this will be not only the words, uh, but also that we see the first companies that are taking the real steps uh, for such kind, of co such kind of companies as we are, is absolutely important uh, that we can there get their support, also some in-kind, let's say support and ability to uh, go for the pilot projects and uh, being able then to jump into the scaling of the systems, not in two, three places, but talking about the tens and hundreds of the places. So all of that, including some public uh, strategy support that uh, I think should be now really rewrited, uh, talking also US, European Union. Uh, now we should include all the real solutions that in five to 10 years can make not only another dependency, I don't know, Middle East, but being able to say, to say that yes, boldly between five to 10 years, we can have absolute majority of resources locally independent. Now, you bring up a really interesting point, which is that I think sometimes, uh, certainly climate uh, action advocates, we tend to look at oil and gas as the enemy. But it's interesting because if we can actually pivot or help them redirect their infrastructure, all the know-how and the uh, assets that they have, uh, rather than trying to drill and explore oil and gas, they can actually apply the know-how and capabilities to geothermal. And it has a very, uh, very much a realistic, um, you know, applicability and, and, a, and an opportunity to replace the lost, uh, lost revenue from, uh, from, from oil and gas. Is that, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. And uh, of course, it will not happen in one day. But uh, if they take these steps uh, bold, uh, we can see in the next two, three years, it could happen because uh, fundamental technologies exist. Uh, also, what they need, uh, there are some, uh, let's call it scalability enablers uh, that uh, these uh, new startups like ours uh, and technology companies can bring to them very quickly with their support. And then within three, five years, uh, it could be real scalable solutions that could be adopted globally anywhere. And uh, uh, of course, in a few years, uh, they can have it as a very strong new business line and uh, being able also to show to their shareholders that yes, we are really taking this seriously, I will not be here in 10 years, the same company as we were five years ago. And that's a huge opportunity for the whole energy market. Yeah. And, and for those that are probably thinking geothermal, that's such a legacy uh, line of work, or 
uh, or industry, but really what you're bringing to market is, is a whole new set of technology uh, under the plasma bit drilling platform. And I wonder if you could give us a little bit of overview around the technology itself and how it's able to uh, go deeper uh, at a lower cost uh, structure and also be able to capture valuable data uh, about the drilling area, including potential sub products. Like without being too technical, uh, because uh, it is uh, quite uh, engineering uh, background on that, uh, is you can, for example, compare the normal uh, metallic sword or steel sword with something you know from Star Wars. And uh, that's very simple, this uh, comparison that uh, by the uh, new way of the drilling that we can use the hot plasma that is able to crack the rock uh, in very fast way, uh, you don't need to uh, make so much the replacements of the drill bits, uh, you can increase the uh, speed of the drilling and you can increase the sustainability and the uh, lifetime uh, of the drill bits. And uh, therefore, this drilling into the depths where always you have the harder rocks, you have high pressures, high temperatures as you are going down, the situation is going worse and worse uh, for the drilling systems. And if you are able to significantly improve these parameters, you can increase the Normal depth that for the oil and gas industry today is typical drilling to two to three kilometers. That is enough for Iceland. If you need to go for the same energies in, a, I don't know, most of the US places, Europe, you have to go to eight to 10 kilometers. Yeah, yeah there exist some kind of these wells today, but they are extremely expensive, uh, mostly for research purposes. To make it as an industry scale, you need such kind of technology that is able to bring these new parameters into that. But what is great, the rest, as, we, as uh, I mentioned before, exists because you have 10,000 trained people. You have the big companies uh, that have uh, 100 years experience in this business and they can do that. And uh, this is for us absolutely unique now opportunity that we tried maybe five, 10 years ago when we just started our activity. It was some dream for us uh, that yes, now it is uh, something that is needed. And uh, of course, unfortunately, uh, also, this war you mentioned uh, is now increasing this uh, problem, and uh, we are happy that we are now almost ready with the solution, and uh, just we need to make some last steps to make it happen. Uh, real quickly, are you able to share a little bit around uh, kind of some of, the, some of the next product or sales or financial milestones? I know there has been a recent corporate round uh, where you have a total raise of almost 17 million USD. Uh, what are kind of the next big milestones in front of you? Yes, it's actually connected with what I mentioned. We are now uh, partnering with a, a few leading uh, drilling companies uh, that are able to help us technologically. Of course, we need now regarding the business, uh, we need now uh, fundraise the rest of the funding in the, in the next round uh, that is for this year uh, to go to the market and being able to provide a set of the tests. And these are our technical milestones or product milestones uh, that we have uh, plans for this and next year to make a set of the testing in the in a Houston. To be honest, it is the mecca of the of the industry today, and uh, being able to start and the field testing and the piloting uh, step by step two three years and uh, to go with a higher ambition than uh, to the bigger project. So I think absolutely important is to run the first successful deep pilot, and then. Uh, you can scale it wherever you want, because here in this solution, the dependency on the geology and geography is much lower than in conventional geothermal today. And for Igmar, uh, can you share a little bit more in terms of the, the next set of milestones or ambitions for We Don't Have Time, given the fact that you guys are just coming off uh, another successful Earth Day? Yes, uh, we don't have time. We are we are a business, uh, and uh, our business model is that we are helping all companies like Geo Drilling uh, to big companies that are transforming their existing business. We are helping them to communicate their progress, uh, and it's a huge market for this because. Uh, if we're going to win the race to zero, you can't win it yourself. You need to communicate it to your suppliers, to your investors, and you need more people to engage helping you. Uh, so today we have 200 uh, partners, uh, everything from global organizations, global companies uh, to uh, United Nations and governments. Uh, and uh, I mean, the market for this will not be smaller tomorrow. 
Uh, and we want to be the platform where this dialogue and conversation are happening. And uh, uh, today we are that, but we need to grow exponentially. So we also have a Series A round. And uh, right now, me and my colleagues are traveling around Europe and US by train. I will not go by train to US. That's impossible. But um, my colleagues will go there. Actually, we are a kind of different organization. Uh, we have uh, local office in Washington and in Nairobi and Stockholm. And I have never met my people that have been working for me for years in, in person uh, because I don't fly. Uh, and the two things why I don't fly, I don't like to, to burn fossil fuel uh, and I don't have time to, to fly around the world to build a global organization. I'm doing it digitally. It's much, much, much faster and efficient. Uh, so if you want to invest in the world's largest uh, communication platform for climate, uh, reach out to We Don't Have Time and uh, you're up for a ride. And uh, we need this platform, not just to, to grow as a company. We need a platform to, to highlight all the solutions. I mean, what Igor is speaking about here is fantastic. Uh, it's so few people that knows about the solution and the solution is great. And it's just one out of many, many solutions out there that exist, but needs more attention, more people involved. And the policy makers, they need to know that we have a technology that could really, really balance the, the, the power system uh, that will fit perfectly in with the renewables and that will help all the oil and gas industry to have something else to do. Because if they are not having anything else to do, they will resist the change. Because if you give them something that they could do instead and make profit out of, they will do that happy. So they will not resist this. This is how we solved another big environment crisis, the ozone crisis. Uh, we had this chemical uh, freons that destroyed the ozone layer. And uh, in 1987, we had this big UN meeting in Montreal that forbid the freons. Uh, and the reason why we succeeded with that, that was that we, we, the chemical industry didn't resist this change of rules because they, uh, they acknowledged that they could sell some other chemical instead. So, so we, can't, we need to get the oil and gas industry uh, to make a profit to go off oil. And the geothermal Agreed. is just one way to do it. Agreed. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think you're absolutely right on. And I think you hit it on the spot. Well, I want to thank uh, Igmar and Igor for a terrific conversation on scalable climate solutions. Please give them a round of applause. Uh, we continue our climate change and sustainability track with our next panel on food tech and sustainability. Mm -hmm.